our, our next speaker is, is Gary Nolan. He got his PhD at, at Stanford in 1989. He then came here uh, and worked with David Baltimore at the Whitehead Institute for the next three or four years. And he ultimately ended up back at uh, Stanford. He's been one of the pioneers in studying single cell, cell to cell variability. Uh, but what he's going to talk about today is the new technology that he's developed that allows one to image with enormous precision dozens of different phenotypic parameters, different markers, within a given single tumor. And this already enormously opens up our eyes to what the true uh, diversity is of, of uh, cells within a tumor, that is their phenotypic diversity, not simply by measuring their genomes. So on that occasion, I'd invite Gary to the podium. I am, of course, thankful to the organizers uh, for the invitation. And thanks, Tyler, uh, for bringing me to this hockey rink, which reminds me of how I was always picked last uh, for hockey, um, and uh, that they would um, be happy to uh, take me if they got um, uh, handicapped three or four goals. Um, okay, so I'm going to be talking about the single cell. So my background originally was in flow cytometry, and one of the problems, of course, with flow cytometry is the limited number of parameters that you can eventually achieve, uh, and the problems of fluorescence uh, being probably the largest of the, of the issues with which one has to contend. And so for many years, I was on the lookout for new technologies that might be available. Uh, and so we came across one actually developed by Scott Tanner at the University of Toronto. He's a mass spectrometry expert, ICPMS, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. Uh, and he had approached us to say, hey, well, you're doing all this single cell stuff. Could you help us actually show what our instru instrument is good for? So uh, the long and the short of how it actually operates is that uh, it's very similar to the, f to the pipeline of how flow cytometry operates. Uh, you start with cells, you stain them with antibodies, and rather than using fluorophores, we're using isotopes, unique isotopes attached to the antibodies. Uh, and you can do about up to about 50 right now is where we're at. Uh, you pass the cells one at a time through a plasma, 7500 degree Kelvin. The cells are completely ionized thereby, uh, and the cloud of ions makes its way to the mass spectrometer where there is a time of flight at the end of it which will then measure the total amount of the metals or other elements that are attached to the cells. Right, you can quantify that information and then uh, basically do pretty straightforward flow cytometry. The problem, of course, becomes the amount of data that you get uh, requiring new uh, manners of uh, study. So one of the additional tricks that we've been adding for the last decade or so to our uh, analyses is that we don't take the cells as they're given to us. We perturb them, usually with cytokines or drugs or what have you. So just like if you come into my office for an interview, I don't just sit there and look at you for 30 minutes and measure your, you know, your size, weight, et cetera. I'll ask questions. Right. Uh, the questions are meant to help me build a model of what's going on inside of your head, depending upon your responses. So we use those kinds of perturbations, uh, multiple different perturbations uh, on cells. We measure then either the surface molecules to classify the cell type, uh, or post-activation, uh, we'll cross-link the cells, say, within about 15 or so minutes. Uh, that will stop the signaling, and then that lets us also stay in the intracellular environment with our antibodies looking at, say, phosphoproteins or what have you. Just a quick way of how we get the metals on, we have chelators, uh, to which then are uh, chelated the uh, ions of interest. We have polycarbon backbones, onto which then those chelators are decorated, and those are attached pr through pretty conventional chemistry to the antibodies. And I want you to remember this number for a minute. We get about 180 or so antibodies per, uh, sorry, atoms per antibody. And that then uh, you can think of as replacing the fluorophores standardly. We then go to the nebulizer, pass them through the flame. Uh, we then quantify the information. Uh, we'll uh, integrate all the data for the ions that are passing pretty much. You can think of them as ionic pulses. Uh, coming to the detector, that would then be a cell, and then we get the 40 or 50 dimensional data, which is, can be thought of simply, as I said before, just as flow cytometry data. 
So it's, heterogeneity is not just about the, the meaning of the word heterogeneity, disorder or chaos. I think everybody here understands that there is meaning somewhere in that chaos. And although I won't go into the details of this, there are many techniques that Donna Pierre and I over the years have been uh, working on and creating to help organize that data. Everything from things which can look into the very subtle differences in uh, correlation matrices, uh, organizers that will take relatively disordered uh, trajectories and turn them into linear trajectories, complex trajectories, organization of cancer. I think actually Donna will talk about this next. And then some other techniques for uh, basically one of the things we're doing is taking the immune system and building an immune system reference map, much like the uh, human genome map. Okay, so I'll talk about maybe one or two of those in a minute. Okay, so the uh, first of the new technologies, once we basically had, had made CITOF and got it working, there's probably several dozen of the instruments around the world, uh, we, you know, one of the things you get back from reviews is, okay, well, you took this complex tumor, you, uh, you proteolized it, you broke it up into single cells, how do I believe that you actually have anything real in terms of signaling at the end of this? Uh, and by the way, you lost all of the order that was there and the importance of the community uh, in which the cells are residing. So uh, Mike Angelo came to my laboratory to basically adapt the isotopes that we'd already had to an imaging format. Um, and so the way that this works is we can take traditional uh, slices. It can be archival, paraffin, what have you. It doesn't really matter. We stain them with our antibodies, uh, which have the isotopes on them, right? And then rather than looking at them by imaging or by ICPMS, we basically use secondary ion mass spec to burrow furrows into the tissue about 10 nanometers or so deep, and, and depending upon the ion beam that you use, anywhere from 100 nanometers to 50 nanometers uh, wide. Uh, we then at least originally uh, worked with a magnetic sector to uh, separate the ions, and then we can reconstruct the images. Right, so this was our paper from Nature Medicine last year where we did 10 different colors by this, and you can just see this was a work with, um, with uh, Genentech. Uh, and John Lowe there to look at breast cancer. And this is not uh, basically peroxidase staining. That is not brown or browner, right? That's actually quantitative information that you can use uh, to actually build and, re and reconstruct uh, all the kinds of things that um, was just shown in the prior talk, okay? But that really pales in comparison to what we want to do, right? We're interested in measuring many different things. We'd like panels of 40 or 50. And somebody often says to me, oh, well, why, what do you need with 50? Well, you need, why do you need more than 50? Well, you need more than 50 when you're fighting over what the 50th one should be. Right, and there's everything about the metabolism, uh, apoptosis, many, many markers. Could it be possible to develop technologies that would allow us to get to many more than even this, hundreds of parameters? And the answer is yes. Okay, so we've used the MIBI technology to push this already to 42 markers uh, with cancer. Um, this is only at about uh, a 500 uh, nanometer resolution. Uh, it was just basically a quick survey to show that we could do it, right? Um, but one of the things that we got interested in is what, rather than doing uh, as many as you can uh, or a largest tissue section as you can, what happens if you were to actually start taking the beam and making it smaller and smaller? Right, what, what can we do? So let me give you a little bit of, a, of an instruction of how that the technique works. So as I said before, think of it as a sandblaster that's blasting off the top, say, 10 nanometers of the tissue. We can change this. We can go as deep as we need to. Right? The image here is actually 50 successive images, one after the other. So you can build up a three-dimensional image of, of this. So what are each of those pixels? That was actually the question that I had when Mike first showed me this. So I said, oh, well, he said, well, those are uh, single molecules. I said, what do you mean they're single molecules? He said, oh, yeah, and we, he, he did the cal we did the calculation. And it turns out that there's the image size, or that's the pixel size that we were working on. The antibody would be in here. This would be, say, the cloud of uh, isotopes that are attached via the chelator. So we're basically within this realm here. We're more or less, if there's only one antibody or one epitope there, picking that up. Right, so we, we know that we're getting at least this, but these instruments are anywhere, it turns out, from one to 10% ion efficient, meaning of every ion that's there, every 100 ions that's there, you're picking up anywhere between one and 10 of them, 
right? That's already the instrument that's there, meaning that with 180 ions attached, we're two to 20-fold uh, over um, um, uh, detecting that particular uh, antibody bound there. Right? So the instruments, though, with the right ion gun are reasonably capable of going down to about 20 nanometers. So this is where we're pushing. I don't have this instrument yet, but this is where we're pushing towards. And the reason for wanting to do that is that you could imagine then if you were to have antibodies against every single molecule or, say, epigenetic mark on chromatin right, bound there, right, you could imagine doing a 20 nanometer resolution build through the entire cell right, get uh, voxels representing that. And it would only take about an afternoon to move through a couple of hundred cells like this uh, and build up a whole 3D image of the cell, right? So eight, an eight billion voxel, every single molecule in its place, uh, basically multi-parameter uh, super resolution uh, capability, right? That's where we're moving. So how do we get there? So this is the instrument that we've got right now. It's sitting over in the engineering department, and it's used by geology and, astro and uh, astro astrology, astronomy. <laughs> um, I've been in California too long. Uh, and the problem, though, is it costs 4.5 million, uh, and there's only a few of these around, so we needed something better. It turns out as well that most of that cost is over spec for our purposes. Uh, so we've built a new instrument. Um, and it's designed specifically for biology. Uh, and the idea here is that we have um, basically a device that has two ion guns, one the oxygen ion gun and then another ion gun which will give me that 20 nanometer uh, desire. We have a TOF detector over here rather than a um, magnetic sector which will let us do 100 parameters at once. But remember that idea of getting down to about only 50 or 20 nanometer resolution? That once you get down to spatial resolution like that, now we can actually start to achieve dozens of barcode concepts, right? We can put two isotopes on an antibody, right? So if we had 50, we'd have 50 times 50 over two, so that'd be 1,250 different antibodies or tags that could be accomplished, right, with that. So it's not just a, not just a simple concept. We've actually built it. Uh, it's undergoing final QC. We've got the ions traced all the way up to the detector, and they're just a little bit off, off center right now. Uh, and hopefully we'll be getting that fixed soon. Reminded me of that, and this is my revenge to Tyler for, uh, for reminding me of my inadequacies uh, at sports. Okay, so um, this is what we are actually able to do with the instrument. It's much, much faster, right? That will, that's the size of what we could do compared to that in the same amount of time. And of course, the, more, the higher the resolution, the longer it would take. Um, but just to give you the, an idea of the number of fields of view that we could get for a pathology services lab, we could do 72 fields of view a day, each in 20 minutes at this level of resolution. And that's only with the ion guns that are already around. I won't go through that. Okay, so what happens if you don't have half a million dollars uh, burning a hole in your pocket? Can we still do high resolution imaging um, with traditional approaches? And I hope the answer I'll show you is yes. So this is a technique which we came up with for using uh, basically any traditional fluorescent scope. As long as it's got two colors, you could do hundreds of parameters uh, per uh, stain, per experiment. So the idea is stain once, so we stain with all the antibodies at the same time, but reveal only two at a time. Reveal, remove, reveal, right? So how do we, how do, we do that? So it's a DNA-based technology. The antibodies are attached to uh, oligos. The gray part here is uh, basically generic sequence. Don't worry about that. Just look at the last nucleotides here. CTG, CTG, A, or G. The CTC we call the index, right? CT, A, or G, C, A, or G. Okay, so how does it work? We basically take polymerase, G, a fluorescent nucleotide, cycle one, add, the index nucleotide fills in the first position, the U and the C fill in there, image, release, right? That whole, that whole round takes about 10 minutes. It can actually be faster, but we've just got it at 10 minutes now. Cycle two, A, U and C, right? So here then the A fills in, 
So what you're doing is at each of the successive antibodies down the path, you're filling in the index and you're walking across. And then that then makes the uh, most terminal uh, nucleotide competent when necessary for f filling in the fluorescence there image. All right. So does it work? So this is just the homebrew that we built. It's just, a it's just uh, something that moves liquids around on a, on a scope. Here's doing uh, basically three sets of two, right, that then can be image processed to basically turn a two-color scope into a six-color or more fax, right? Um, and by the way, the, uh, as Donna will hopefully um, agree with, because I showed her this morning, the, once you remove uh, a set, it's completely gone uh, from the prior. We completely removed the prior uh, material. Um, is this going to actually go for me? This is a 22 color. Yeah. So there's a 22 color, right? 11 different rounds. This is t uh, um, tissue. Uh, this is a spleen. So you're looking at germinal centers uh, with 22 colors there. Um, so how do we go more than that? We find that after about 15 or so of these cycles, you start to lose some of the uh, resolution. So the way to do this is to use different, the way to increase this is to do multiple sets of 15, um, where you would have a, none of these are capable of doing anything. Uh, you basically add an oligo in here, and that lets this set of 15 run, and then you run an oligo. After this is done, you add an oligo here, which lets then this 15 and this 15. Does it work? So here's basically using one set like that, right? So there's basically using three different sets. And on the right there is doing a 64 parameter uh, analysis, right? And so we're pushing, we actually now have conjugated over 300 antibodies, and we're pushing forward to doing the tissue sections with 300 parameters. Um, it works for RNA as well. We have a variety of approaches for looking at RNA, but we could uh, also do um, the Polyak approach as well. Uh, and uh, basically, we just do a rolling circle amplification after a proximity ligation event. In here are then the, uh, the indexers, uh, and that lets us do, here's just a proof of concept, three different uh, pairs of RNAs. Uh, there should be no limit to the numbers that we can do. We've got proteins and RNA working at the same time. So uh, all the complexity, I think, that anybody might be interested in, uh, we can ex uh, access. So I'll, I'll just uh, sum up then, uh, showing you how we've actually used CYTOF for looking at ovarian cancer. It's actually far more than 10 that went into this. Um, so what we've done here is this gives you some idea of the kinds of uh, panels that we're building. We have tumor panels where we have antibodies that tell you stem cellness, surface marker, set, uh, cell cycle, what have you, pleiotropism, intracellular markers of interest. Uh, and then we have other antibodies uh, panels where we're talking about uh, all the kinds of immune system cells that might infiltrate into the, into the tumor itself. So these were all run then on uh, multiple um, ovarian cancer uh, ascites. Um, and then we use a variety of computational approaches, but you can look at these maps and think of them as, as really what we've done is we've organized clusters of phenotypically similar cells that are near each other in high dimensional space. Those that are relatively near each other will be connected via lines uh, that you're seeing there. So the bubbles are basically a, a cell populations, and then the lines are connectivity patterns. But what we've done is we've taken all 20 or so of the patients, and we put them into one giant data set to do the clustering. And the first, I think, most unique thing that comes out of it is that despite all of the genetic variability that might be underlying these cells, there's actually a relatively limited amount of phenotypic diversity, right? They fall into this basically tree pattern. Um, and so what we do is the size will be the relative size of the population. The color is the relative amount of, say, a given marker. In this case, it's E-cadherin. And so the, it's, if we have an EMT transition, you can see that all of the uh, E-cadherin epithelial are on this side. This patient, obviously, uh, she was a re relapse. And you can see something quite interesting, obviously, there, that she's gone to the, uh, to the mesenchymal um, here. Right, so that's e-cadherin. Sorry, was that vimentin? No, there should be an e-cadherin. Yes, this is vimentin, right? And you can see uh, again, as uh, was shown in some of the prior talks, the the harbingers of future doom uh, exist 
here. But what's nice here about, other than the genetics that people are looking at and seeing the diversity, now you're starting to see what the effects of those genetics are in terms of the uh, phenotypic diversity that's there. But the phenotypic confinement as well, I find interesting. Um, Snail was interesting because snail is a marker of the EMT transition, and although you can't see it in all of those, if I were to, you can see it at least here, the bridge between those two compartments is composed of by where the snail is. Snail, interestingly, is often also in the termini here of the post-EMT transition cells, and very often, as it turns out, co-expressing with SOX. And what's interesting about at least ovarian cancer is that we find SOX populations in both of the uh, compartments, suggesting at least to the extent that SOX is involved in regenerative processes, um, it might actually, there might actually be two different types of uh, ovarian cancers here. Um, so, and as well, because we can look at uh, the immune system cells, the angiogenic, the stroma, et cetera, we can start to do correlation analysis across uh, these to say, are there certain cell populations in the immune system that are uh, predicting the presence or absence of cells? We've only been in the tumor itself or vice versa. We've only begun this, but you can see a lot of the diversity that's in these tumors. Look at this for the immune system versus this for the immune system here. So when we do a correlation analysis, one of the first things that came out, interestingly, uh, in these tumors was an NK cell subpopulation uh, that several NK subpopulations, not all NKs, just some, that predict the size of, of certain other tumor populations uh, quite nicely. When you ask actually what those things are, it turns out that there are particular kind of NK cells that are only found in the placenta of women. Right, and here's the phenotype of them that actually is quite intriguing. Uh, they are pro-angiogenic. They are immune system suppressive, right? So these are probably the, this is probably the worst kind of cell that you want in a tumor, right? Uh, because if these things are here, they're pro-angiogenic and anti-immune system. So these decidual NK cells might actually be telling us something that they're basically already residing. They're waiting to be uh, to do something important for the placenta, but it seems that tumors might co-opt them. Um, and then just finally, although I won't go into it, this is about the diversity. Here are a couple of immunotherapeutic uh, markers that people are focusing upon, and this just shows you amongst the 20 or so patients the kind of diversity that we're getting here. We haven't done any of the computation on what this means yet uh, according to outcome. Uh, and then here are some interesting uh, intracellular markers as well that are differing considerably between uh, the immune system cells in these uh, tumors. Uh, and I'm well ahead of time. So uh, this is my laboratory. Uh, I did the work. I've called out most of the people either doing the MIBI, uh, the RNA, and or the, uh, the ABC-seq approach. And Wendy Fantel, uh, an assistant professor, out of my group uh, did the ovarian cancer work. And we, of course, are thankful to our many uh, different supporters uh, and funders. Thank you very much.